Um, but I really uh, feel that this is important. I get a lot of questions regarding 1031 exchanges, and I know muy poquito. That's about as much Spanish I know as well. Um, but I say that because when I call Greg and I ask him any of the questions or I align him with any of my clients, he answers within minutes. He will get in contact with your clients and he will make you guys look like the experts when you're talking about 1031 exchange to your clients. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know that through our company, we are lawyers title, we are under what's called the Fidelity National Financial Umbrella. And so all of our F and F brands, my sister companies, I'm not gonna name them because mm -hmm. we're still competitors. Well, even we're a sister company. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But that's this is our uh, exchange accommodation service that we utilize. And so whenever I have an office that says I want more information about 1031 and can you bring someone, I bring Greg. I've been working with them for over 10 years. So Anyway, I'm going to get started because he's a lot of good content, and he's also going to talk to you about investors in a way that you can approach them as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, good morning. Good morning. So, my name is Greg Burns. I work for a company called the IPX 1031. Actually, our full name is Investment Property Exchange Services, Inc., and then we made that name and realized it was way too long, so now we go by IPX 1031, so if you look for our website, it's under IPX 1031. We are a qualified intermediary, accommodator, facilitator. We facilitate exchange transactions. Uh, we've been doing it for about 30 years. I've been with the company for 23 years. Um, last month, I did about 146 transactions. It was about $280 million uh, of, of proceeds, about $600 million of real estate. So there are still a lot of people. Oh, time to wake up. <laughs> I'm so, uh, uh, so the exchange market is actually still pretty good. Uh, there's still people exchanging. There's always reasons why people want to do exchanges, right? Uh, so 1031, just for those of you that have never done one or don't really know, it's a section of the tax code which allows someone that owns property that they've held for investment or business use to sell that asset off and then exchange it for another property that they intend to hold for investment or business use. So what it basically does is allows kind of some freedom and some movement within the investment side of real estate, right? If you, every time you sold an investment property, you had to, you know, pay for your closing costs, pay, you know, capital gains taxes, right? Probably would lock, kind of lock people into property. So the 1031 gives some liquidity, allows investors to move between investments without having to pay capital gains taxes every time they do to do it. Now, these are tax deferred exchanges are not tax free. So I had a client call me, it was probably about a year ago. She said, hey Greg, I did an exchange with you about a year ago. I'm thinking about selling my property and I'm wondering how long I have to hold it before I can sell it. And I said, oh, are you thinking about doing another exchange? And she said, no, I just want to sell it and cash out. And I said, you can sell it anytime you want. She said, why would they let you do that? I said, why would they let you do what? She said, well, why would they let you do a 1031 exchange, buy a new property, and then just sell it and not pay any taxes? And I said, who said anything about not paying any taxes? I didn't, I didn't say anything about that, right? What I did say was that you know you could sell your property at any time, but the taxes are still there, right? So you're just deferring them into the next property. Now there is, you know, people will say, well, why should I do that? Why should I defer taxes? Why don't you know if I'm just kicking the can down the road? Why shouldn't I just pay taxes now and then worry about it later? The idea behind 1031, you know, is to you know use money you would normally pay in taxes to make go make more money, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have a, an investment deal that's paying me five percent, and I have a hundred thousand dollars more in that investment because I, I deferred taxes on it, right? I'm making a five percent on another hundred grand. Or some people use it as an estate planning tool. They call it the swap till you drop program, mm -hmm. right? You exchange throughout your lifetime. When you pass away, you heir that property to your, you know, kids or to your wife. Uh, what happens? They get a step up in basis, right? Which eliminates the taxes. So that's a way you can go from, you know, tax deferred to kind of tax free. They say the two things in life: you can't avoid death and taxes, but you can't avoid some taxes by dying, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it put that way. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, so. There's lots of reasons why people do exchanges, right? And, and anytime someone's selling an investment property and they're talking to me, I always ask them the question, what are you trying to accomplish by selling the property, right? You know, when you're on a listing appointment and you're talking about the property that they're selling, you know, it, that's an important part of it. But also the most important part of it a lot of times is 
what are we trying to do? You know, what are we trying to accomplish by selling this property? Are we trying to, you know, are you trying to build your portfolio by a bigger property, right? Are you trying to, you know, you've got two units, you now you want to get to four units, and we're kind of trying to build your portfolio. Are you doing it because you're getting older and you're tired of dealing with the terrible teas of real estate, right? The tenants, the toilets, the taxes, the termites, all the fun <laughs> things that are associated with managing property, right? Or do you, you know, so do you want a passive type of investment? You know, are you doing it for cash flow reasons? Are you doing it for geographic reasons, right? Like you may have a client that owns a property here in Elsinore that lives in Phoenix and you go, hey, is it challenging for you to manage your property here, uh, you know, and live in Phoenix? They might say, yeah, it's really challenging. The property management companies out there are you know, not doing a good job. Well, have you ever thought about selling your property here in California and exchanging it for a property in Phoenix? A lot of people don't know that you can do that. In fact, I've had accountants tell their clients you can't exchange out of California and defer the California tax. That is absolutely not correct. Wow. California does have what they call a clawback provision, where they basically say, listen, we'll allow you to sell out of the state of California and exchange into another state and you can defer the California tax. But if you ever sell that property that you bought in another state and cash out, you will need to come back to us and pay us the taxes. Now, up until about seven or eight years ago, it was hard for them to track it, right? So, you know, a client would sell a property in California, they go buy a property in Nevada, right, do a 1031 exchange to further taxes there. Let's say they moved out of the state of California, they didn't live here, and then they sold the property in Nevada. People weren't going back to the state of California and saying, listen, I know that you don't know this, but when I sold that property in Nevada, I'm here to pay my taxes, right? <laughs> so about eight years ago, the state of California put a filing requirement in that says, okay, we'll allow you to sell a property in California and, and do a you know, 1031 exchange and go buy in another state, but you've got to file something with us every year showing that you still own that property. And if you ever sell it and cash out, we want our taxes, right? So California does have a filing requirement, but you can defer the California taxes. Now, you can sell that property in Nevada, do a 1031 exchange, go buy another property. You don't have to pay the taxes. When you ultimately cash out, that's when the state of California wants their taxes, right? So, so you can exchange out of the state of California. And we had lots of clients do it. I didn't see a lot last year. I saw a lot in 21, people going to places like, you know, Tennessee and Texas, right? In fact, I think California's, Californians single-handedly double or triple the value of properties in Idaho. And let me tell you, they're not happy about it, right? So <laughs> a lot of people, you know, exchanging the properties in Idaho. You know, it was during COVID, right? People were feeling like they were kind of locked into their property. They, you know, you know, rented an RV. You couldn't find an RV to save your life, right? And they went up to Idaho and went like, this is living, right? This is where I want to retire. So we saw a lot of people exchanging into properties in a place just like Idaho. The one thing that kind of gets caught up, I think, when you're doing 1031s, is they call them like-kind exchanges, right? So it's kind of a misnomer. People say, oh, well, if I own, let's say, a duplex in, uh, you know, uh, let's say Lake Elsinore, what's like-kind with another duplex? Well, probably another duplex, right? Uh, or if I own vacant land, what's like-kind with vacant land? Probably more vacant land. Well, the like-kind rules for real estate when it comes to 1031 are really broad which means that I can sell any kind of real estate that I've held for investment or business use and buy any other kind of real estate as long as I intend to hold it for investment or business use. I mean, I had a client call me like two or three weeks ago. He said, hey, I own this vacant land. I want to sell it. I want to buy this four unit deal in a San Luis Obispo, but my accountant says I can't exchange vacant land for improved property because that's not like kind. That is 100% incorrect. Right, mm -hmm. so you absolutely can you know sell vacant land, buy approved property that works just fine. So you can sell residential, you can buy commercial. Like I had a client one time, they sold some residential property, and they were out looking for property to buy, and she, and, and she was having a tough time, and she called me up, and I was like, well, "What do you? What would you? What are you looking for? What do you really want to buy?" She's like, "Well, you know, we were looking at like you know uh, duplexes and triplexes, but what I really would love to buy is kind of an industrial warehouse building." because uh, we have a construction company where I could run my company at it. But I'm like, well, go buy that. She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you can buy an industrial building. She's like, yeah, but we're going to use it you know, run our business out of it. I'm like, it's investment or business use, right? So you exchange the investment for a business use property. It absolutely qualifies, right? Question on that, the like kind. 
an example from the vacant land to the develop, you know, the approved property. Approved yeah. property. Sure. Does the monetary value come into play, whereas that improved land has to be greater than the value of the right. vacant land? Yeah. So okay. always in an exchange, there's two things you want to do in order to not pay taxes. You want to buy something that's equal or greater in value than the property you sold, right? And that's the sales price less closing costs. Mm -hmm. So if I sell a property for let's say five hundred thousand, let's say I pay uh, you know forty thousand dollars in closing costs, my net sales price is four hundred sixty thousand. That's what I got to go replace. I can buy equal or greater than that, and then I have to reinvest all the proceeds from the sale, right? If I do those two things, I'm not going to pay any taxes. You have to be a little bit careful. Last night I was uh, you know, on a phone call, uh, returning some emails, and this morning I was on a phone call with a client who sold the property, a condo, she then did a 1031, bought a single family home that was more expensive than the property she sold. But what happened was they overstated the loan. So she ended up having $23,000 left over, which then became taxable to her, mm -hmm. right? And she, in her case, she wanted to use all of the proceeds. So, it is important to tell them, hey, listen, like, you know, we might be one way or the other on the loan, but it's important to look at that number because they really overstated what they really needed in a loan. Mm -hmm. So in her case, she's going to end up paying taxes on that $23,000. Now, what if you have a client that sells a property and wants to take some cash from the sale? Can they do that? So you got a client selling a duplex, let's say, for $600,000, and they want to take, say they have, uh, you know, $200,000 of debt, $400,000 of equity, and they say, listen, I really like to take $50,000 from the sale as cash, and it's, but I still want to do an exchange. Can they do that? They have to pay taxes on it. That's right. Yes. They can do that, right? But they're going to pay taxes on that $50,000, right? And same thing if they buy a less expensive property, right? I sell for, let's say, $600,000 net. I go find a property that I love. It's only $580,000. Maybe I've got $10,000 in closing costs on the buy side. So I'm going to pay taxes on that ten thousand dollar difference, right? So you can't buy a property that's less in value. Most of our clients they buy more expensive properties. Most of the clients you have doing exchanges usually buy something that's more expensive than what they sold, but they could buy something that's less, right? So like kind rules very broad, right? Is it real estate? Are you holding it for investment or business use? If you are, as long as what you're buying you intend to hold for investment or business use, it'll qualify. And what about holding times? Like how long do I have to hold a property in order for it to qualify for an exchange? Let's say you sold me that duplex in uh, Lake Elsinore. Let's say you sold it to me eight months ago. And you sold it to me for 500 grand. And you call me up and go, listen, I got a client that is really looking for a property. I think I can get them to offer you $650,000 for that property. And I said, well, that's great. I'd love to sell it, but I really want to do an exchange. I've only held it for eight months. You know, do you guys think that I can still do an exchange? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, right? So the rules say that you have to buy the property with the intent of holding it for investment or business use. I bought it with the intent of holding it for investment or business use. Somebody came in, made me an offer that was too good to refuse. Shouldn't prohibit me from doing an exchange. So there's no set time that you have to hold it as long as it's for the business or investment purposes. That's right. That's right. Now, there is something that's in Section 1031 that says property that is held primarily for sale doesn't qualify under Section 1031. And the reason that they put that in there is because they don't like seeing developers or people that are flipping properties doing exchanges. Those are looked at as properties that were purchased with the intent of holding them for sale. I bought it with the intent of rehabbing it, fixing it up, and then putting it back on the market and selling it, not for investment or business use. What if you had a client that you were selling their duplex in Lake Elsinore for let's say 600 grand? They say, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to go buy a vacation home in Hawaii. Can I do that? What do you guys think? No. 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 Ooh. If it's a business, if, if you are being be it out, it's business. Yeah, so number one rule in sales, not allowed to say no, right? So that's <laughs> number one rule, right? Can't say no, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you have to hold that property as an investment. So a vacation home can qualify as an investment if it's used less than two weeks out of the year by the owner, yeah. and they show at least two weeks of income on that property, a fair market value a year. So I had a client, sold a property in Encino, and she said, 
I know what the rules are for a vacation investment property. But I know I can only use it for 14 days a year, and I know I have to rent it for at least two weeks a year at fair market value. But how can I use it more than that you know, and not get in trouble? I said, well, um, any time that you spend at the property doing maintenance or making improvements doesn't count against your two weeks. So she probably did, spends a lot of time making improvements to the property. There's lots of Home Depot receipts probably, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's only good for, uh, I mean, that's good for the first year, but what up, you know, how about for the future years? I mean, how many so really there's a revenue ruling out there that says any property that's been held as an investment for two years or more, in an audit, the IRS can't challenge the held for investment portion of the exchange. Which means that if I hold that property as an investment for two years, after that, I can pretty much do whatever I want with it. Mm -hmm. And so you do see clients like, hey, like I have a triplex in Monrovia. I sell the triplex, I convince my wife, okay, we're gonna retire in Canyon Lake. I buy a property in Canyon Lake. I rent it out for two years, hold it as investment. I then decide, okay, I'm gonna retire. I sell my primary residence. I take my primary residency exclusion. Then I convert that property to my primary residence, no problem. Mm -hmm. So you do see people that are doing that or buying properties in areas. Uh, like I, I had a client not that long ago, bought a property in Carlsbad and that they're ultimately gonna retire in. Initially, they have to hold it as an investment property. And then eventually they're going to, you know, sell a property in the Inland Empire and go retire in Carlsbad. So you do see clients that are doing that. Um, you know, most of our clients so are, you know, buying things primarily for investment. We do see a lot of people right now, especially the baby boomers. You know, they are looking for passive types of investments. So they're going into these things called like triple net lease investments. Have you guys ever heard of those? So a triple net lease investment, you guys kind of see them all over. Like you have Walgreens, Walmart, and Dollar Tree, and Jack in the Box, and Carl's Jr., Chase Bank. All of those properties are owned by an investor. Starbucks, let's use them as an example. Starbucks is in the coffee business, right? They're not in the real estate business. They don't want to tie up a bunch of their capital owning the real estate that their stores are in. Although, if they did, they'd probably be even you know wealthier than they are today, right? Yeah. It's like the DSD, right? Same thing. Yeah. So we'll talk about that too, right? So you know, uh, so the client can go out and buy a Starbucks. Starbucks is responsible for the maintenance on the property. They're responsible for the taxes. They're responsible for the insurance. So the owner of that property just collects a check. They pay their mortgage if they have one, and then what's ever left over is theirs. So. Like, I have a Starbucks down the street from my house. About two months ago, someone decided to drive their Prius into the Starbucks, right? Wow. So as a landlord, right, as an owner of the property, they're not responsible for it. They're like, listen, you still pay me rent, you fix it, right? You're responsible for the maintenance of that property. And so it's opened it up to a really, um, a kind of a national market, right? Because what does it matter if I, does it matter if I own a Starbucks down the street from where I live, or if I go to Starbucks in you know, Austin, Texas, nope. it doesn't really matter, right? Because Starbucks is still gonna pay me rent, right? And so it's opened it up to kind of investors in investing across the country. When I first started, I knew one guy in Encino that did triple net lease investments. Now today, I probably know more than 600 people wow. that specialize in that asset class and only sell triple net lease investments, wow. right? And so people that are looking for passive income, right? So that like, you know, own some property and like, listen, I don't want to deal with tenants anymore. I don't want to pay taxes. They're investing in buying these types of investments or buying Dollar Trees and Jack in the Boxes and 7-Elevens yeah. and, you know, all of these things, right? Now, here's the thing. So two days ago, I live in Monrovia. I was driving down uh, a Colorado Boulevard and I looked to the right and I noticed there was a, used to be a 7-Eleven there and it just became a liquor store. So 7-Eleven probably pays high square footage rent 
and they probably left that location. So if I own that 7-Eleven, right, if I was the owner of it, and their lease expired, and they left, guess what? I don't have a tenant anymore, so I gotta go get a tenant, right? So they're not foolproof, right? I mean, you know, if you had a, a big, huge store with Bed Bath & Beyond in it, what do you probably have right now? You have an empty store, right? That you've gotta put as a tenant in. So they're, they're, they're certainly not without risk, uh, but they are uh, an interesting form of ownership that people are investing in. Uh, someone mentioned, you mentioned the DSTs, the Delaware Statutory Trust. So the Delaware Statutory Trust is kind of an offshoot, a little bit of triple net leases. They are for people that want to be passive investors. You're saying, listen, I don't want to manage property anymore. I'd like some diversity. I'd like to uh, you know, be able to buy a property and not have to manage it, but I still need cash flow. And so, these real estate companies are called sponsors. They go out and they buy typically large portfolios of properties. They typically buy well, triple net lease investments, they'll buy like self storage facilities, they'll buy apartments. And so they buy these types of properties. Typically, it's a bulk of them. So, like the last one uh, that I remember, there were 16 self storage facilities in Texas, right? And so they bought this deal for like $50 million. Then they so sold off small interest in that property. So a client that had, I think the minimum investment was like 200,000. So if you had $200,000 and they had like 46% interest, you know, a, a debt on the property, you could buy roughly about a $400,000 piece of that property. And now you own a small percentage interest in 16 self storage facilities in Texas, right? So it allows the client some diversification, right? Because they own 16 different properties now. If they have you know, more money, they could go into another deal. Maybe they could buy another deal from a different sponsor that's apartment buildings. Like one of the, the sponsors is really big into student housing. They buy a lot of student, student housing around colleges. So the challenges with those types of investments are, one, you've kind of given up control, right? You're handing the keys of the bus over to you know this sponsor and you get on the bus and the bus is headed to florida and you're on the bus right you can't really say okay i want to sell now there's really not a secondary market for it. they typically sell those assets every five to seven years and then at that point when they sell you have a choice hey i can go back into traditional real estate i can cash out or i can go back into a dsd but it may be you know Something that's a viable option for a client that says, listen, I, I don't want to manage property anymore. I don't maybe have enough money to go buy my own triple net lease investment, but I do want to become a passive owner in real estate. So the reason that I mentioned triple net leases and these DSTs is just so that you know that they exist, right? You don't need to be an expert in them. In fact, the DSTs are not even sold as real estate. They're sold as a security. So they're sold through like a financial advisor. But... It is important, so if a client comes to you and says, listen, I want to sell my property, but I don't want to manage real estate, that you know that there's something out there that exists that allows them to do an exchange and go into something that where they no longer have to manage. The, very, the most important part of an exchange is advanced planning. When you sell a property, you have to have a plan in place that's executable, you know, you know so that you can complete your exchange. The clients that I have, that typically run into the most problems are they'll call me like 40 days into their exchange and they'll say, hey, I am just having a tough time finding property. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, everything out there is just so expensive. And I'm like, well, did you get a lot of money for the property you sold? They said, yeah, that's why I sold it. And I said, well, do you think no one else's property appreciated during that time, right? <laughs> Everybody else's property went up just like yours did, right? So it's important to go into it with a plane, right? You're typically not selling high and buying low. That typically doesn't happen, right? You're buying and selling in the same market. That's why it's called, like, you know, some people refer to it as a trade, right? And so it's important to go into it with a good executable plan. A guy had a client one time, she sold a property, she wanted to buy a two bedroom condo on Coronado Island, which is down in San Diego. And I said, okay. I said, are there a lot of condos for sale? She said, well, I really want to buy in this one condo town. And I'm like, okay, you've limited your search to one condo town. Okay, fine. I said, well, how many two bedrooms are, or how many properties are listed for sale? She said, 
there's only one listed for sale, it's a one bedroom, but I want a two bedroom. I said, okay. I said, well, how many two bedrooms have sold in the last 60 to 90 days? She said, none. I'm like, that's a bad plan. That's, a bad plan. that's not a good plan, right? So you can expand your search, yes. right? So it's important to go into that with you know with an executable plan. Yeah. Specifically, the properties appreciated that the, you know what we saw with the rapid you know equity growth. Yeah. You know a year ago. Yeah. It was hard to even get into these properties. What are, what are those people? What did those people do? For the net great example where you already did the transaction yet you can't find a property because or or you were outbid. I mean, that was yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it was a very challenging market. I mean, I would say if you go back to December, November, December of 21 and January, February of 22, we saw, so typically our completion rate of exchanges is 93%. We saw that number drop into the 70s during that time wow. yeah. because there was almost very low inventory levels. There were buyers that were chasing deals like crazy. It was a very hard time to do an exchange. What I can tell you is this, in the 23 years that I've been doing this, no one ever says, if I could just sell my property, I'd have no problem finding a replacement property, right? There's always, it doesn't matter if the inventory levels are high, low, buyer's market, seller's market, it's always challenging to find a replacement property. So, you know, it may be an objection that you have to overcome. They may say, listen, I know in an exchange, I only have 45 days to find a property and I'm concerned that that's not enough time to find a problem. Now, is the way to overcome that objection is this. One is, you know, your standard, you know, contingency period in a contract is like 17 days, right? So about 20 days before your escrow closes on your sale, we can aggressively start making offers. Because by the time we make the offer, they count or whatever, we get accepted, we're probably gonna be in that 17 day window. So you can add like 20 days on to the 45 days so you have like really more like 65 days to find a property. Well, what if they say 65 days still doesn't seem like enough time? Is there any way that you as an agent can give me more time to identify property? What do you guys think? Don't say, don't say no. Don't say no. Are you giving me the answer to the test? Yes. Yeah. In the planning process, we identify yeah. properties before we go to sale. Well, th that can be challenging to try to identify and get people to agree to an offer before your property sells. We can talk about reverse exchanges and we will at the end. But, but what if I just build some extensions into your escrow, right? So somebody comes in, makes me an offer, standard 45-day escrow or 30-day escrow, and I ask the right to the seller to extend escrow one time for 15 days. So if we get to the close of escrow, we haven't found the property that we want to buy yet, the seller has the right to extend escrow one time for 15 days. Most buyers are amenable to that, right? Most buyers are like 15 days, not the end of the world. You know, we can go ahead and we can live with that, right? So that's one way that you can buy them sometimes. So you go, oh, we had, we thought you had 45 days. I told you we have another 20 days on top of that. And now you have 65 days. And even if I can only negotiate in one 15 day extension, right? Guess what? Now you have 80 days to go find property. It take 80 days, it's kind of like 90 days, kind of like three months. I probably could find something in that time, right? Now, sometimes people will say this, well, what if I do this? What if we say that we won't close on the sale until I find a suitable replacement property? So it's contingent upon me finding a new replacement property. Here's the problem with that. One, it's an open-ended contract, number one. So you're gonna scare off a lot of buyers. But number two is, one of the basic definitions of a contract, it has a beginning and an ending date. So even if I go into escrow with that contingency in there, I'm gonna have some escrow period. It's gonna be 45 days, 30 days, whatever it is. Once I am outside of that contract period, I am no longer under contract, even if it has that clause in there, right? So once we get past our 45 day escrow period, I'm, theoretically my buyer's not under contract anymore. We're outside of the dates of the contract, it's not really an enforceable contract anymore. So you could then lose the buyer. So I like building extensions into escrow. I don't like long escrow periods. I went out of time at a client. He said, oh, I've got it figured out. I've got my property under contract for sale, but I have a 120 day escrow. I said, okay, great. So 60 days into his 120 day escrow, he finds a property he wants to buy. But he has to put a 30 day escrow for the property he's buying. 
So he calls the buyer of the property and says, listen, I know we have a 120 day escrow, but that was just for me to buy some time for my exchange. I found the property that I want and I need you to close, you know, before 90 days because I've got to close on this replacement property. What do you think the buyer says? He says, no, I'm going to stick to the 120 days. This is a developer who is like, I'm going to take as much time as I can without tying up my money. So extensions, building short extensions are great in your escrow, right? It's a way to buy your clients some time. Now, what if you had a client that was talking to you, let's say I you know, own this duplex over in Lake Elsinore, let's say I've owned it for 20 years, and I'm talking to you about selling my property, and I ask you, listen, if I just decided to sell it today and cash out, what kind of taxes would I have to pay? What would you guys say? Call your CPA. Call your CPA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least, so, at least so with the safe answer, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that anytime you're in, and you know, I've seen a lot of agents that are guilty of trying to give their clients more information than they should. And I will always tell them, don't do that, right? So, but anytime that you're in a situation like that, a answer is good, you know, the answer in this case should come from their account, right? What I tell them is this, at a minimum, you're gonna pay 24.3%, right? That's 15% federal, 9.3% state, that's the minimum you can pay on the sale of investment property. Depending on how big your gain is, depending on how much depreciation you've taken, depending on what your income level is, those percentages could go up. And they could get as high as into the 30s, right? But I don't know specifically what you file on your tax return, so talk to your tax advisor, right? But that's a good answer. That's giving them some information. Most of my clients, 24.3. So that's 15% federal, and then 9.3% state. Most clients end up probably above that number, but uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, 24.3 is the minimum number they do. They have a lot of depreciation. Yeah, they've taken a lot of depreciation, they have a lot of gain, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and we've certainly seen a lot of depreciation in real estate over the last couple of years, and so they could, you know, certainly pay a bigger number than that. So the client yeah. says, <laughs> yeah. That's what you said. Yeah. So I decide to list my property with you today. I list my duplex with you. I've signed your listing agreement. You know I'm gonna do a 1031 exchange. What do you do next? Call Greg. Call Greg. <laughs> she call you. She call you. She call me, right? Yeah, it's a good answer. Oh, you say what you next. Prepare to call us out. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, the first thing that you do when you get a listing is what? Prepare to sale, right? Just like you would any other deal. It's no different, right? There's only really two things you have to do that's different in a 1031 than in a traditional sale. You mark the property for sale, you get an offer. When you get an offer, you need to counter that offer or you need to put in your contract something to the fact that the client's doing an exchange. There's a car form that you can use uh, that's in wind forms. Uh, you can also just put some language in there that says the seller's intended to complete a 1031, I've seen it which will not delay the closing or cause any additional expense to the buyer. Now, a lot of people ask me, if I know the client's doing an exchange, should I put that in the listing? My opinion is no, and let me tell you why. So, over the course of you know the last 20 years, I've received numerous phone calls from agents that said, hey, Greg, uh, I'm re representing this buyer, I saw this property in the MLS that I'd like to show my client, but it's subject to a 1031 exchange, and my buyer doesn't want to do an exchange. And I'm like, no, no, the, seller the, the seller of the property is doing an exchange, the buyer is not, right? And so, uh, and so I spend a couple minutes explaining it to them. But for every one person that gets that, I get that call from, there's probably hundreds or thousands that don't. Right, to just go, you know, it's subject to a 1031, you don't want to deal with that. And so they just pass on the whole deal, right? Don't even know. 1031 is not a condition of sale, right? So let's say you counter the, uh, you know, the offer with whatever terms you want to counter with and some exchange language in there. And that agent calls you up and goes, you didn't tell me it was a 1031 exchange, we don't want to be involved in that. Fine, you don't have to cooperate with my client's exchange. The only requirement is that I notify you that my seller's doing an exchange, that's it. Your buyer's not involved, doesn't affect the sale, it's not a condition of sale, but your buyer cooperate, right? You just have to put the language in there. 
Now, once you put the language in the contract, right, you open up an escrow. The only thing that you have to remember to do that's different than a regular sale is you have to hire a company like ours or me, right, uh, before escrow closes, right? It's very easy to do. You say, hey, Greg, here's the name of my escrow officer. Here's their contact information. Here's the property address. Please reach out to them and get the exchange set up. Now, that's when we get involved from a paperwork standpoint. People say, well, when's a good time to set up an exchange? I always tell them, once contingencies have been removed, like you get through inspections, you know, all that kind of good stuff, it's a good time to get us involved. From a paperwork standpoint, from a question and answer standpoint, I can get involved at any time. So the client could maybe not even have their property listed for sale. And you go, oh, this person's got a lot of exchange questions. Let me get Greg on the phone with them. I'm happy to get on a conference call with you. I can call them directly. Whatever you guys need to help you, you know, get through that process. I am just an extension of your team, right? And so whatever I can do to help you kind of move through the process, get your client, clients comfortable with the idea of how exchange works, I'm all for it, right? So don't hesitate to get me involved. But from an actual paperwork standpoint, we don't get involved until they're kind of in escrow. So we contact escrow, we get a copy of the contract, the preliminary title report. We use that to draw up our exchange documents. We typically will send everything to the client via DocuSign. Client signs our document, sale closes, proceeds of the sale come over to us. Lisa and I will typically go to Cabo for a couple See weeks. <laughs> At that point, right, that time clock starts ticking. Let's go back up a little bit. So about 10 years ago, I was in a Keller Williams office in Downey, and I did a presentation like this. And after that presentation, one of the agents came up to me. She was a brand new agent. She said, listen, I have no business. I just started, and I think I want to do some kind of marketing to investors. Every time I speak at a board, right, I like speak at the East Valley board all the time, and every time I go speak there, I always ask the question, how many of you guys do some kind of farming or marketing to, you know, owner-occupied people? And like 99% of people raise their hand. And then I say, how many of you do some type of, you know, marketing to out-of-the-area owners or absentee owners? Like one or two people out of 100 will raise their hand. Those people don't get marketed to as much. I don't know why, but it's a good opportunity. So this agent said, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to put together a class and I want to, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes on what's going on in the current market, you know, like listings and what's going on with pricing and, you know, number of properties that are sold and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to have a lender come up and talk about what's going on with interest rates and all that kind of good stuff. And then I want you to talk for like 45 minutes on 1031 exchanges. So I said, yeah, no problem. So she, uh, you know, sent out this invitation to like, I don't know how many people, maybe 2,500 people that were in the area that were absentee owners. She got 45 people in the room. Now she did go to Costco and get like, you know, cheese trays saying hors d'oeuvres are gonna be served and some wine, right? But she got five listings out of that deal. Wow. Now, where can you go to find absentee owners? This lady right here. <laughs> She's got you trained good, all right? <laughs> yeah, so she can get that information to yeah. you, right? And you can put all kinds of criteria in. It is amazing what the title insurance companies can do, right? So, you know, our company, we're the part of the largest title group in the country. And so, when I first started, Lisa would be able to take you to like Laker games, and all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't been around that long enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have these expense accounts and they could do all kinds of things. Yeah. For you. But sometime during the you know Great Recession, yeah. the the state came in with something called SB 133, which basically limited their ability to basically spend any money. I mean, like you know, like can't spend anything. And so. But because of that, our companies have done a really good job developing technology to help you guys in your day-to-day -day business. And so she has unbelievable tools that you guys can use 
to really help you earn money, right? And at the end of the day, you know, while it's great to go to a Laker game, <laughs> it's really not going to help you earn any more business, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely use her for that kind of stuff. Uh, we have letters and postcards that you guys can use to market to investors. Uh, those are free. Just call, you know, just you know, let me know, and I'll be happy to send those to you. Um, also, uh, I'm going to send Lisa, and I'll have her send it out to you guys. Make sure you give her your card and, and let you know. And anybody that's online, you know, please email her. Because I'm going to send you guys uh, our brochure that I handed out in PDF format. I'm going to send you our brochure on reverse exchanges. I'm going to send uh, our booklet on 1031 topics. I'm going to send it my V card. I'm also going to send you a 1031 checklist. What I want you to do is go onto your computer, right? Create a 1031 exchange file folder and put all of those attachments in it. The reason is because six months from now, you're not going to remember who I was. It doesn't matter how dashing and you know funny I was. Right? <laughs> it's not going to make a difference. You're going to be like, who was that exchange guy, right? So but now you'll have all that stuff at your fingertips, right? So a client has a question, hey, let me send you a brochure on 1031 exchanges. Or hey, how does the process work? Well, I've got this checklist, I can send you this checklist, right? Or hey, I've got some questions. Oh, let me see what this guy's name was. I open up my file folder, hey, it was Greg, you know, and we'll go ahead and you know get in touch with them. So it's a good resource to use uh, and have. So you've got 45 days typically to identify property. Now, does anybody know what's going on in California uh, you know, with time deadlines when it comes to taxes? Has anybody heard anything about that? That they've been extended? They've extended them, right? They've also extended times to identify property. They've extended that to October 16th. So if I have a 1031 exchange open right now, let's say I close today, I would have till October 16th to identify and close on my replacement property. It's a tremendous opportunity. Now, why did we have that opportunity? You may ask. California got rain. And we don't usually get that, so apparently <laughs> it's, it's the whole state's a disaster, right? So if the first notice came out in January, we had that first storm. Uh, came out, the notice came out on January 8th. And then we had another storm. And they said, oh, California's getting snow. <laughs> give them more time to identify property. Also extend your timeline to file your taxes to October 16th. No way. Yeah. That's a video, guys, on your yeah. social media. Update yeah. your client. Yeah. yeah. So no more April 15th, all the way to October? October 16th. And that's for state taxes? That's for federal and state. Federal and state, okay. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So, you heard it first here. Yeah. yeah. And I just, you know, so I can send you that notice. Uh, you certainly, obviously, can talk to your CPA about it. But so it did extend time deadlines for 1031 exchanges. So normally in an exchange, right, you have 45 days to identify property. 45 days really is a good thing for an agent, and the reason is because has anybody in here ever worked with an unmotivated buyer? So the person calls you like, hey, what are you doing on Sunday? You want to drive around look at houses? You're like. Yeah, I've got nothing else to do in my life. Just to be right. so, uh, uh, so, you know, the 45 days motivated. So when people say like, hey, what advice can you give me on doing an exchange? One, have a plan in place. But two, be aggressive early. You want to get something under contract in escrow on your buy side as quickly as you can and get all of your due diligence done before the 45 days comes up. And the reason is because if something happens and there's a hiccup, you want to be able to go out and identify additional property or find something else, right? And so that's what I always tell clients, be aggressive early. Like I see clients all the time. They find something four or five days into their exchange. As an agent, you go, listen, this is a good deal. It fits the criteria, we should make an offer on it. Uh, I think we can find something better. And then 40 days later, they're like, oh, why did I make an offer on that property, right? So be aggressive early in the transaction. Is your question? Yeah, I was wondering what about if they want multiple properties? Would they want to do everything concurrently? So you could sell one property, buy multiple properties, right? Or you could sell multiple properties, buy one. Like I have a client right now that called me yesterday. They want to sell seven single family homes 
and exchange that into uh, one large apartment building. You refer to us? So you get a listing, you get a listing. We'll be back every week. It's going to be real full next time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Stay in the room over So, um, so uh, the reality of it is you want to be aggressive early in the transaction, right? So you can't sell multiple properties by one, sell one by multiple, so you still only have 45 days, okay. right? So you want to try to get those things under contract as quickly as you can if you're buying multiple properties. And in that scenario where you're going from seven to one, the clock starts when that first property closes. Yeah, so I get calls from people all the time that are like, hey, you know, I'm, uh, you know, my first listing ever, it's a 1031, I'm so nervous, and you know, I'm always like, don't worry about it, it's easy, you know, just relax. But one time, like, Five years ago, I got a call from an agent with the same kind of scenario. They're like, hey, this client's doing an exchange. It's my first deal ever. I'm super nervous. And I'm like, what's going on? They're like, well, they want me to sell like seven properties and exchange it into one. I was like, you should be nervous. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? So what I told them is this. I told her, I said, listen, you need to make sure that you get all seven properties on the market at the same time. And then as these go under contract, the first one goes under contract, you want to have as long of an escrow period as that buyer will give you. And the next one, you know, it keeps extending it out, extending it out. In her situation, she ended up getting five of the seven closed before they had to close on the purchase property, right? And then the other two properties that they had had not closed yet, so they ended up doing a reverse exchange on those properties into that one property that they bought. So there are ways of kind of getting that done. Uh, but you are right. The big challenge in selling multiple properties is that you have to get them closed. The time clock starts the date the first one closes, and you know you've got to get them both closed, or you know any number of them closed before you close and replace the property. Otherwise, you're in a situation where you have to do a forward exchange and a reverse exchange. Now, how do you identify property? What what does that mean? Well, when the client closes on their sale. We're going to send them out, you know, something that shows how much money we have, so they can show that for proof of funds. We're going to send a letter showing, hey, here's your 45th day, here's your 180th day, day, right? And then we're also going to send them out an identification statement that they can write in the addresses of the property they want to identify. There's two basic rules that people use. There's a total of three, but really only two rules that people use. One is the three property rule, which allows them to identify three properties. That the value of those three properties doesn't matter. They just can identify three, right? So they identify, you know, one, two, three, Canyon Lake Boulevard, four, five, six, you know, Main Street, and you know, one, six, eight, you know, uh, you know, Rodeo Road or whatever, right? Those are the three properties they identify. They can buy any of those three. But the next rule is what if somebody wants to diversify? What if they want to buy more than three properties? Well, what rule can they use then? Well, there's a rule called the 200% rule. And that rule says, identify as many properties as you want, right? But the total aggregate value of those properties identified, right? So the value of them added together can't be more than twice the value of the property you sold. So if I sell a property, let's say for a million dollars, I can identify up to $2 million worth of real estate. And so like I had a client uh, in California one time, she was an agent. She sold the property in Orange County for like 1.2 million, and she wanted to use those funds to go buy houses in Arkansas, single family homes. And she was buying from for around $200,000 each. Wow. So she could identify as many as she wanted up to twice the value of the property that she sold, right? So typically people use that rule when they're gonna diversify, when they're gonna sell one property, buy multiple properties. So buying one, selling one, probably the three property rule. Buying, you know, selling a large property, buying smaller properties, probably, uh, you know, the 200% rule. So sell one, buy one, three property, sell one, buy multiples, probably 200%. So once you get past the 45 days, you have another 135 days after that to get your transaction closed. So 45 days to identify, plus 135 days after that to get it closed, it's a total of 180 days, right? I used to tell clients you have 45 days to identify and a total of 180 days to close. What do you think they did? 
Yeah. They added 45 to 180, uh-huh. came up with like 225 days. Uh-huh. Like, so now I said, right? <laughs> so now I tell clients you have 45 days to identify plus another 135 days after that to close, right? It's a total of 180 days. Getting the thing closed in that 180 period is typically not very challenging. It's identifying those properties within the 45 days, which is tough. Now, when it comes to vesting, right? People say, well, the way you hold title on the sale is the way you got to hold title on the purchase. That's not necessarily true. What the government is looking for is who the taxpayer is, right? So let's say that I sell the property in a Greg Burns Living Trust, right? And so sell the Greg Burns Living Trust, I go to buy the new property, and the lender says, we don't lend new trust, you have to take title in your own name. And I go, well, I'm in a 1031, I gotta take title the same way, right? You don't. If I have a property in my trust, who's the taxpayer? I am, right? It's passed directly through to me, right? Now, if I pass away from one of these potholes that I'm <laughs> <laughs> all the way here, right? Yeah, then the trust does have a tax ID number, it becomes a taxpayer. But if it's my living trust, it passes through directly to me. They call it a disregarded entity for tax purposes, right? So I can take title in my own name because guess what? It works just the same. I'm still the taxpayer, right? So I sell the Greg Burns Living Trust, buy as Greg Burns, no problem. Where you typically run into issues with this type of deal is typically when there's a partnership. So let's say Lisa and I own this office building. If we did, we'd probably be on a beach, sit the market, or something, right? <laughs> but let's say we own it in an LLC, right? So the LLC actually owns the real estate. Lisa and I, we just own an interest in a partnership. We actually don't own real estate. So we can sell this asset and the LLC can do an exchange. But if Lisa and I want to go our separate ways, we can't really do that. And so there are multiple ways of dealing with that depending on if she wants to cash out and I want to do an exchange or she wants to exchange, I want to cash out or if we both want to do an exchange. There are lots of different ways to get that done. But if you have a partnership on title to a property, one thing that you should remember is that like, it's very common for people to buy a single family that's a rental or a duplex that's a rental or, you know, and then put an LLC on title for liability purposes, right? You always want to ask them, hey, I see that you have an LLC on title. You can pull a you know, preliminary title report or uh, a property profile will show that right as well. The yeah, the vesting. Ask them, hey, is this a disregarded entity, right? Do you, does the you know, LLC issue K-1s to partners or do you guys just report this on your tax return? Because if they actually issue K-1s, right, then it's set up as a multi-member LLC, which is not disregarded for tax purposes, which means the LLC is the taxpayer. And if there's any loans that are involved, what's gonna be your problem if they're buying residential real estate? Lenders don't lend to LLCs on residential real estate. So you've got to make some, you know, adjustments before they sell, right? So, you know, certainly. I mean, from this class, taxes to the DMV yeah. is a rough day. Right? Right? That's a rough day, right? Yeah. So, uh, so make sure that the vesting, you know, if, at least the taxpayer is going to say the same. And if there's an issue with it, get me involved in it. We kind of work our way through it. So the last thing I kind of want to touch on, before I touch on reverse exchange, I want to touch on refinancing really quick. Do not refinance a property and pull cash out before you sell it and do an exchange, right? There's a particular doctrine within Section 1031 that says, if you take a step to take cash out of this, the property before, right before you sell and do an exchange, they could collapse the whole transaction. They call it the step transaction doctrine. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. Now, afterwards, after you completed the exchange, right? I sold the property, I did a 1031, I bought the new property. They have no issue with it, right? So you could sell, buy, refi right after that, no problem, right? Refinance, non-taxable transaction, pull cash out, no problem. If you refinance before you sell, 
they should probably hold the property for six months to a year before they sell and do an exchange. Finally, reverse exchanges, right? So we talked about the regular forward exchanges, right? So you sell the property that you have, then you buy the property that you want. Reverse exchanges say, listen, I want to buy the property that I want before I sell the property that I have. So you have a client that comes to you and they maybe see one of your listings and they go, listen, I want to buy that listing. You go, okay, great, let's make an offer. They go, well, here's the thing. I've got this other property that I would like to sell and exchange into that. And you go, well, here's the deal. We're probably going to get multiple offers on this. The seller's not going to wait for you to sell. So do you have the ability to buy this without selling this property that you have? They say, yeah, I've got the ability to buy it. I've got, I've got the cash. Okay, great. So you make an offer. You put it under contract. The property they're selling, it's not even for sale. They hire us. We create an LLC that's going to assign into that transaction as the buyer. We are the sole member of that LLC. We make your client the manager. They loan us the money to buy the property. They actually don't send us the money, they send it to closing. But that LLC shows it as a loan to, you know, uh, from this client. We close on the property in the name of the LLC. We then triple net lease the property back to the customer. So we talked about that earlier, right? So the customer has, you know, all of they collect rents, they, you know, uh, you know, keep the insurance on the property. They basically act as the true owner of the property. We're just holding title. From the date that we close, they then have 45 days to identify the property they want to sell, and they have a total of 180 days to get it sold. So they put their property on the market that they have, they you know, get it under contract, get it into escrow. We assign into that transaction on their sale, right? Just like a regular 1031. So when that sale closes, the money comes over to us, and then we use that money to pay them back the money that they loaned us to buy this property. And then once we've completed that, to try to avoid double transfer taxes, right, because we've already paid transfer taxes once on the initial purchase, we give them 100% interest in the LLC we created. So instead of doing a property transfer, where the LLC transfer the properties to your clients, we give them 100% interest in the LLC we created. So they end up owning the property in the LLC. Now, they are a more complex type of an exchange, which makes them more expensive. So regular you know, exchange, we charge a flat fee of $1,000. Reverse exchanges start at about 6,500, which is more expensive, but right, if I have a four or five hundred thousand dollar gain, and I'm looking at paying, you know, you know, one hundred twenty or one hundred fifty thousand dollars in taxes. You know, sixty five hundred dollars may not be that big a deal, right? So, say, already a viable option if you have a client that you know wants to do it and has the cash and ability to do it, they certainly can do it. Now, are there any questions? So, I guess they're ready for the test. <laughs> I do have a question. I know of, um, there's a company called Picasso where they sell shares of a property. So say there's a vacation home in Lake Tahoe, so yeah. instead of it being like a timeshare, they, they, they create an LLC and then eight, eight individuals buy into the LLC and own an eighth of this property. So you can't buy an interest in a partnership, right? So I cannot buy an interest in an LLC to complete my exchange. I could buy a tenant in common interest in that property to complete my exchange. So there are syndicators that syndicate properties like that that maybe have something that's in a 1031 that will sell them a tick interest in the property and then eventually they'll probably convert it into the LLC. But you certainly could do that. Yeah. Anything else? You guys all good? Yeah, no, I Question, uh, yeah. what about the templates you guys said? Do we email you directly? Yeah, you send me an email. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good, thank you. Beth. Yeah, definitely be nice to side the market to, um, you know, the absentee owners that just have that plan in place, have the materials yeah. that you guys can utilize. And then, of course, if you have any questions, like Greg said, with your clients, there's so many times, probably, I don't know, every week I'm reaching out to you going, great, can you contact? So I'm always putting you in touch with you guys and making sure that your clients' questions are getting answered too. So 
hopefully you yeah she's probably the answer she could probably answer like maybe 50 percent <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a first call your secret yeah, yeah. I, I, I do my best I'm, but I'm, I'm trained you guys like i want to add value that's what this whole business is about right if there's something that i can help you with and and I believe, and that's why Greg's an important part of my business because I know that when those questions do come, he's going to make you look like a superstar to your client. You won't leave that phone conference um, call or conversation going, oh, why did I call Greg? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's definitely worth it to have the basics. You don't need to know all of this and have it all you know memorized, but know enough to do your social media videos, do that update that you just gave on the, on the tax That's extensions huge, yeah. is huge. Yeah. I would be doing a, a, a post on that, talking about it, and then even uh, utilizing some of that for when you are marketing to your, your sphere of influence too, that decide, you know, have you thought about doing a 1031, having that seminar you talked about and inviting you, and yeah. you know, there's it's so many ways that you can have an event, there's a lot of ways that you can play off 1031 exchange, so. I appreciate you coming and driving the rain, and yeah, yeah thank you guys, and I appreciate right. you guys being here as well. Absolutely, thank you, yeah, thanks so much. So, a quick question about no, nope. can, <laughs> <guys do, laughs> can you work DSTs as well? So, we do the exchange side of it. So, we're not a DST company. DSTs are sold through like a financial advisor. Yeah, we we have a bunch of technologies. Yeah, so if you were a one stop shop. No, 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 we don't do, we don't get involved. We only do the exchange side. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Can you review again the triple net lease? investments just the bullet points that you so i mean triple you see them everywhere right so you know basically a lot of retailers you know mcdonald's carl's jr jack in the box dollar tree starbucks coffee bean yeah. you know walgreens walmart you know and so the idea behind a triple net lease is you're buying the real estate but the the tenant let's say starbucks they're responsible yeah. for the maintenance of the property the insurance the taxes basically you act like a passive owner where you get income from the property. Starbucks pays you rent. If you have a mortgage, you got to obviously pay your mortgage. And then what's ever left over is yours. Yeah. And so, but if I'm the one, am I the only one owning that real estate or I'm part of a group that owns it? So typically with triple net lease investments, you're going to be the one that owns the property. Now there are companies that buy exclusively portfolios of triple net lease investments that you can buy into and that's the Delaware Statutory Trust companies that I talked about earlier. Okay. Right? They might buy a portfolio of like there was one I saw, it was like 20 different properties. And they try to do different what they call food groups. So they do, hey, we own a uh, it's like a like a, a drugstore like a CVS. And then we own like a, a Vaughn's shopping center. And then we own automotive. We'll put like an Auto O'Reilly's auto parts store in there. And then we're going to own a convenience store. So they'll put them into these kind of packages where they have all these different food groups and they sell off a proportionalized interest in those properties. When you're just going and buying your own triple net lease investment, you're the only owner of the property. And and you're the company that facilitates the 1031 exchange into that triple net? Right, so okay. I'm not going to sell you, like if you say, hey, I've got a client that really is interested in buying triple net lease investment, right? So Keller Williams has some people within their group, like there's the Sands group, that specializes just in triple net lease investments. Mm -hmm. And so I can hook you up with somebody like that that can say, hey, here's some, like my client's gonna sell the property for 800,000. I go, okay, well, here's some triple net lease investments that are around that price range that you can show them that they could potentially buy if they'd sold it in an exchange. Public commercial. Yeah, public commercial. Yeah. Okay, so would you say it's better to invest in the triple net leasing than to invest in like, like say I wanted to buy like a duplex? So there's two theories of thought, right? For you, you're young. Right? Yeah. So you can triple that lease investment, the lease is the lease, right? They say, we're going to pay you, you know, $2,500 a month, and every two years there's a 5% increase. If you buy a duplex and you go into that duplex and you paint it and you rehab one of the units and you improve it, you can really add value to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when, what typically what I say to you know, younger individuals is people are always going to need a place to live. Right, buy something where you can make improvements. You can roll your sleeves up, add value. That's a better way to kind of increase and improve your portfolio, make more money long term. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you guys for having me in. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't he great? Yes. Yeah, <laughs>